we had an opportunity um, to go to Libby, Montana, and so I want to back up a little bit. So one of the things that God was showing me, I had a dream where I was sleeping, and um, in my dream, my body, like I flew up and I started going up above Oregon, Washington, and I saw like my whole region, you know, that I help oversee the West Coast, and it was all like pitch black. And what started happening is uh, one bulb lit up and I started looking at the towns that it was started lighting up. They were small towns. They were not like big cities, but they were small towns. And so I saw a bulb lit up and then another one and another one and another one throughout the whole West Coast region. And then as they were lighting up, then next thing you know, the whole West Coast was glowing and it was on fire. Not literal fire, but the fire of the Holy Spirit was manifesting across the whole West Coast. And then when I woke up and I was thinking, uh, like, what, like, what does this mean? And the Holy Spirit showed me that revival is going to break out when people that care about their communities, small cities, when they're going to start doing the message, start implementing what Jesus commanded, and as these little towns light up, then the whole, uh, it will just catch, other towns will catch on fire. So to get a fire going, for those of you that started fires, so we live on property, so we do a lot of fires, what's easier to light up? If you have a pile, you know, the size of an acre to light up, or if you have a small, tiny little, uh, you know, just little, you know, couple pieces of paper, right? So the smaller uh, something is, the easier it is to light up. And then once that lights up, you start adding to it, adding to it, and then it becomes into a big fire. And so what I started seeing is that we need to go into every small town that we can and start preaching the gospel. And when these people get a hold of the truth and they start lighting up their town, then the news will spread really fast. And when that happens, then other people are going to want to have the same thing. And that's how revivals uh, started in the past. And so... God has been given us opportunity to go into small towns and to do DHTs and to do conferences. But when we go in there, we advertise as the DHT so people can come for healing. But when we actually get there, we minister salvation, you know, deliverance, healing, uh, whatever the need is. And so um, we, I told God that I really don't care how many people show up, but the people that do show up are the people that want to do something about their town. So if five people show up but are willing to do something, I'd rather have that than have 200 or 300 people show up and just listen to a bunch of information and leave and not do anything with it. And so uh, we've been very blessed. We've done quite a few of these DHTs going into small towns. And what we're seeing that as we're doing that, uh, we're seeing impacts in those towns and things are starting to shift. And so we have a lot of invitations uh, to go into these towns, and so we've been preparing our team to do that. And so I'll start out with reading Mark 16. You know, this is the commandments of Jesus that he commanded to his disciples, and everybody here is a disciple, and we'll look at Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, go to Mark 16, and we'll start in verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked them their unbelief, and hardness of heart. So what Jesus did is Jesus does not like unbelief. So the number one enemy of Jesus and Father God is unbelief. When we don't believe what God's word says, when we read it and don't believe it, be prepared to be rebuked. Jesus will never accept unbelief because remember when we're going through the DHT, unbelief is one of the things that stops the power of God. Traditions of man and unbelief. And so disciples, after Jesus was resurrected, they were in unbelief. When the ladies came and told them, like, hey, we saw Jesus was resurrected, they didn't believe him. And so Jesus rebuked unbelief. So as a body of Christ, unbelief is something that we need to stay away from. So if you're reading something, it's hard for you to believe. Start with being honest with God and say, Father God, I don't understand this all the way, but... Help me understand it. I want to believe. Instead of starting like, oh, this is not real, this can't happen, and immediately just reject it, allow the Holy Spirit 
to train you or to start showing you so you can start growing into believing this truth. But the starting point should always be that whatever's written in this book, in God's word, is the truth. And it supersedes everything there is. And so that's how Jesus started out when he saw them. Um, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world. And that's another thing that I like about Jesus. When he rebukes you, he doesn't stay in that state for very long. I mean, he, he'll bring you correction. And immediately he will go back to telling you what you need to be doing. So get out of what you're not supposed to be doing as quick as possible. And as fast as possible, get into what you're supposed to be doing. And he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this verse is where a lot of people struggle because they think that they need to go somewhere on the other side of the world. It does not say here, go into the other side of the world. It says, go into all the world. So if I turn around and next to Dan here, am I in all part of the world? Yep. If I turn here and I minister to Natalie, am I in all part of the world? So anywhere we are in this world, we are in all part of the world. So which means that you don't have to go very far. Anytime there's a person in front of you that you can minister to or help, and like I said, it could be different, depends on you know, where you're at and how much you, you've grown, but you can start out ministering to somebody just by being nice to somebody. Number one is don't be a devil. And we say, what does it mean to be a devil? So when somebody does something to you or, or for no reason, you can, be, you can start out with being a devil to them. You can yell at them. You can tell them how horrible they are. Right? And so as, for human nature, it's really easy to do. So start out by not being a devil to them, but by being Jesus. And so start encouraging them. You can change the atmosphere. Just whatever the situation is, um, and it's hard sometimes from a human perspective, but I'm, what I'm learning to do for myself is no matter how tempted I am to really let somebody know how I feel, what they did or what they're doing, I'm learning to hold back and be patient and allow Jesus to come through instead and not myself, you know, you know with what, how I feel about the situation. And so building people up, encouraging people, telling them that they're going to have an amazing day, something as little as that, by changing their atmosphere, by changing their reality, is us already ministering. It doesn't mean that you have to go immediately get them saved, get them delivered, get them healed, and everything right on the spot to every single person you see. It could just be there's a variety of different things that you can do to start helping a person with whatever you know, they're struggling with or whatever they're dealing with. And so just by sometimes asking somebody, how's your day going? Or is there anything that's bothering you? Is there anything that I can help you? And this is what I try to do at work. Uh, I'll just come up and I'll just talk to a person and I'll encourage them. And so that is already ministry. Anytime that we can get them to shift off of what the devil is showing them and get them to shift into the positive direction, into the direction of God, that is already us ministering. And so, and that could be done. We, you don't have to go to Africa because if you think that before you get to Africa, you can't do nothing or whatever you know, the thought is, I always thought that um, one of the reasons why I hated having to get into ministry or anything is because I thought that in order for me to do that, God's going to send me somewhere where I don't want to go. He's going to send me to Africa. He's going to send me somewhere into a really bad spot. That was my imagination. No, the ministry is literally right there, right in front of you. You don't have to go really far. Anytime you see people around you, you're already in part of all the world, right? So he said, go into all the world. And he didn't say go on the opposite side of the world. But for some reason, this is the people's perception. Because when they come to talk, they say, okay, so I'm trying to figure out where God wants me to go. Should I be going to India? Should I be going to South America? And I said, no, how about turn around and wherever you're at, start right there. And once you become successful with that, then you can start thinking about other places. But your starting point is right there on the spot. And if you're ministering to people right there, right where you're at, you're going to qualify into the scripture where it says all the world. Does that make sense? That's really important because a lot of people are thinking that it's something that, that's an event. And we always teach here that everything in the skipped scriptures is continuous. 
It's never starting and stopping. It's a lifestyle. It's who you are. It's how you live. This is how we have to grow into it. And so um, this is what I train myself. Uh, instead of having this event mentality, because that's the way Christians think, Christians' mentality is, okay, I'm a Christian right now, and then I am something else right now, or I am ministering right now, and I'm not doing that now. And so we're, we're looking at, is it on and off all the time? Where Jesus always talked about, it's continuous. You are Jesus walking on the surf, so you're walking this out continuous as you're going. So it's a continuous state of being versus an event to event to event. So you're continuously being Jesus to people, and it could be in anything. And if you want to figure out how Jesus was, start studying his character, start learning who he is. And so, um, and that will help you to get started. But every single person, um, it's a command of Jesus that every believer is supposed to be doing something, and it does not have to be the same. It could be different. For every person, it could be different. And then as you're going, you'll grow into doing more you know, or being more efficient or how, whichever path you take, it will change. But you got to start with where you're at, starting with your family, starting with people around you, and start affecting people the way Jesus would. And preach the gospel to every creature. So this gives you permission, you know, if you're shy, you can start teaching, you know, you can start practicing your cat and your dog, whatever pet you have, start practicing start telling them, you can come up to your pet and start telling them like, hey, God loves you. And they're not going to argue with you because I know with some people, sometimes I'll come up and I'll tell them God loves you and they'll start arguing with me why they won't. And so practice, you can practice with every creature, but you know, eventually don't get stuck there. Don't start a pet ministry <laughs> because Jesus is in the human ministry, right? So we set the captives free. But you can start with that get some boldness, and then transition to people. So verse 16, he says, he who believes, so the first requirement is believing. So there's two categories of people out there, believer, believers and unbelievers. And a lot of people struggle with that. And so he who believes is when you read what Jesus said, you believe and do. The way you can prove to yourself or test yourself whether or not you believe or not is whether or not you're doing what it says. So, for example, if the Bible says um, God will provide for you, and then you read it and it says, okay, God will provide for me, and then you walk out and you start telling people, I'm going to lose my job. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to go broke. I'm going to lose my house. All of these bad things are going to happen. That automatically puts you into the unbelieving category because you're saying things that are against God's word. So if you can't say what God said, then I would just say, shut your mouth and don't say anything. You will continue staying in belief if you just don't say nothing. If the devil is tempting you to say something that goes against the scripture, don't say anything. Just be quiet. Don't say anything until you go back into the scripture and reread it. Also, if you don't know what to say, pick up your Bible and just read it. He has already put it in here for you. He made it very easy and so we have to dis discipline ourselves when we're, we're tempted to run our mouth to say things we're not supposed to say. We can go back to the scripture and just read what he says. He said, you know, like, I will be your provider. So like, okay, God, you are my provider. You are my provider. You are my provider. Your boss tells you I'm going to fire you. You're going to say, um, yeah, okay. But my God says that he is my provider. And you're not going to agree with what your boss says. You're going to agree what he says, what God says about you. And you just keep speaking the things that God says about you and don't go into unbelieving. So um, I'm learning how simple believing and unbelieving is. And so I want that to be very clear. I want everybody to be very grounded in what it is when Jesus says those who believe, what does that mean? It does not mean that you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. The devil believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's not getting him into any better situation. Those who believe are the ones that are doing what he says or the ones that are standing and saying only what he says. 
And if you continue saying what he says, eventually you will start doing. At least start with not saying what he says, then transition to start saying what he says, and then as you do that, you will transition into doing what he says because hearing comes, sorry, faith comes by hearing, right? So as you continue saying what you're supposed to say or hearing what you're supposed to hear, faith will start kicking on. It's already in you. It will start getting turned on and, you'll, and it will start getting activated. So does that make sense? So you guys understand what believing is, right? So believing is when you only agree with what it says in here. So if CNN goes on and says, everybody's going to die, the way you react proves whether or not you believe or not. If immediately you say, oh man, like this is it, this is over, and you start saying goodbye to everybody, kissing everybody, telling them, you know, see you on the next life, um, you're an unbeliever because you believe something against God's word because God said that he will protect you. A thousand will fall on one side, 10,000 will fall on the other side, but it will not touch you. It doesn't matter what kind of bombs are flying, what kind of missiles are flying, none of that matters. We're continuously getting reports from Ukraine right now is that where believers are at, they're not getting touched. Things happening around them, but they're not getting touched, they're protected. So to some, God reveals and shows that they need to you know, move out before anything happens and they move out to some you know, like things happen to the left, to the right, and it doesn't touch him because they stand on this truth because they got grounded in this message and they're seeing it live in action. And so this is where we have to stand. We cannot allow fear to enter us because fear is believing what the devil says. There is no fear will never come from God. Fear always comes from the devil. Amen? So he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So again, Jesus makes a very clear separation. So there, the whole gospel is that everybody's saved and you know, everybody's going to sing Kumbaya and all of that stuff. Jesus didn't say that. He said, if you believe, you will be saved. If you do not believe, you will be condemned. Who do you get condemned with? Who's condemned of this world? The devil, Satan, yeah. So it, God is very clear. Jesus is very clear here. Like he's not saying you can go ahead and be an unbeliever and I'll figure out a way how to get you into heaven. No, he does not say that. Our requirement is to believe. And when we believe, we're saved. When we don't believe, we're condemned. We have to be very honest with people. So believing is a requirement. There is no getting around believing. Amen? Amen. So we have to preach the truth and preach exactly what God's word says versus our opinions or our feelings or thoughts or emotions on it. And these signs will follow those who believe. So Jesus laid out a prerequisite. So he said these signs. And so he starts out saying that these signs, and then he lists off the signs, follow those who believe. Okay? So... There's a couple things that we're looking at here. Signs will follow. And so is it very clear? He didn't say in there signs might follow or signs will choose to follow. He didn't say anything. He said signs will follow. So is everybody clear? Okay. So signs will follow. Does everybody believe that, right? So this is straight, you know, if you have your Bible, it's in red. This, these are Jesus' words. Signs will follow. These signs will follow. Who will they follow? Those who believe. So if you don't believe what God's word says, can the signs follow you? No. So if you don't have any signs in your life, uh, guess what? It's because you don't believe. Because Jesus made it very clear. So for the first 25 of life of my years, uh, sorry, 25 years of my life, I did not believe that what the Bible said. And I've never seen any miracles. I've never seen anything. I didn't even, like, I was actually questioning whether or not God even exists. Well, during my teenage years, I was debating whether or not I should leave God altogether and become an atheist. That is how 
much because I read the Bible a lot, but I never sat working. It was because the way I was trained was to be an unbeliever. And so our job as the local body here is to train everybody to be a believer. So everything that we do should lead you to believe, to believe. We should, that's why we have testimonies. So when you hear testimonies, God's doing this for Dimitri, God's doing this for this person, God's doing this for this person, in your mind, what should be happening, Holy Spirit should be reminding you, God did this for this person, he will do it for you. And so everything is set up in here for us to be believers, to where we see, if, you, if you're not seeing it in your life yet, you're listening to what God's doing in other people's life, which means that God has to do it for you because if he does it for one person, he has to do it for everybody else. Amen? That's why Jesus made it to where he paid the same price for everybody. If he will heal one person, if you believe, he has to heal you. He cannot not heal you. Otherwise, he'd be a liar, and we know that God is not a liar. And so the only thing is just we just might not believe. And so we have to start turning on the believing. Believing, 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 believing. And in order for that believing to be kicked on, we have to be reading, reading, repeating, speaking it, dwelling on it, and just, just dwelling in what he said. So for me, when I say, you know, when I hear Jesus said, these signs will follow, so I expect these signs to follow. I expect that every time I lay hands on somebody, something is happening. Whether or not I see it or not, I expect that something will happen. The only thing I do is I remove the time. We always have to remind people, remove the time. Don't worry about how fast it's going to be. Remove the time and just stand on what Jesus said, what God's word says, until it starts manifesting in your life. Okay? So, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. See, Jesus made it so simple. It's not in Vitaly's name. It's not in Natalie's name. It's not in Dan's name. You know, the other Natalie's, Oksana's or Alex's names. No. Jesus made it really simple. Just believe that these things will happen because of me, because of Jesus. Everything that we're doing is in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay? So everything's in his name. So you don't have to worry about how it's going to happen, whether or not he's going to do it. Remove all of that. He said... These things will ha happen to those who believe, and these things will happen in Jesus' name. So the first part is they will cast out demons. So every believer can cast out demons. Every believer. Jesus cannot lie, so every believer can cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Every believer has the ability to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in new tongues. Okay? So if you're a Baptist, repent, get baptized, and start praying in tongues. Don't be an unbeliever, be a believer. Amen? I'm just reading what it says. It, it makes it very easy. Like, this is not my opinion, this is what Jesus' opinion is. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Again, so Jesus is speaking protection. It doesn't mean that you should just go start living with snakes and eating their, you know, like their stuff. You know, don't be doing that. But if you come across anything deadly, expect that it will not hurt you. Just like we shared, you know, like with COVID and everything that was going on, none of that stuff can touch us. It has, it's illegal. If you believe, it will not touch you. It, it's very simple, right? That's what Jesus said. Uh, if you don't believe me, believe him. Be a believer and believe what he says. I'm just telling you what he said. My job is easy. I just read what Jesus said. And leave my opinion out of it. I just speak his words, and then it makes it very easy. It will by no means hurt them. And the last part, it says, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So when believers lay hands on the sick, they will recover. When believers lay hands on the sick, they will recover. So what if an unbeliever lay hands on the sick? Will they recover? No. Only believers. Okay? So, as a believer, if you consider yourself as a believer, when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. It doesn't say that they're going to have an instant miracle, which it's okay to have an instant miracle, but they will recover. 
remove time from it, and wait until it manifests. Wait till the result manifests itself. It could be a second, it could be a day, it could be a week. Doesn't matter. Remove the time. Remember, God lives outside of time. God honors believing. And so our job is just to stand on believing, stand on what he said. And when we do that, then very good things happen. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're kind of, um, my goal today through our panel is to kind of walk through step by step a little bit how we prepared, how we were ready to go there. And everybody has that opportunity. And so we'll just kind of show like what we do in our church as a training center, how we prepare leaders to be able to go out and do what we did. But overall, what happened is we saw people delivered. We saw people get healed. We saw people get baptized in the Holy Spirit. We even got to witness a couple get married. We participated in a small wedding. I did not plan for a wedding. No invitations were sent out. But as we were in the ministry, I mean, on the mission field, ministering, all of a sudden, an opportunity came up to marry somebody, and we witnessed somebody to get married. I mean, this is how awesome it is. You get to participate in every kind of event. Also, when we were there, you know, we saw people, you know, that they, they were eating, and so they fed us. And so we just got to witness pretty much everything in here. Um, the only part that I did not see, you know, witness is nothing deadly came up against me. Um, and it could be, we did go hiking in the forest. So there was uh, a bunch of uh, bears there. So I could technically say that nothing deadly came up to me because there were signs that they're all around us, but I didn't see any of them come up and attack me. So even though we were close to the water where they're supposed to be, but no bears came up and touched me. So and within six days, I got to see every part of the scripture fulfilled and more. Like it, Jesus didn't even say that you're going to see weddings. Uh, he said in other scriptures because Jesus did attend a wedding, right? And so we got to attend a, a mini wedding. And so it was really cool to see how when you're obedient, how when you believe and how you make yourself available, you get to see all of these things that happen. Amen. So it was a lot of fun. So we're going to start out with um, how, so um, one of the things that God is showing us is that we need to get, build as many leaders as possible. So our, Jesus' job was to produce disciples that would reproduce what he did. And their job was to train somebody else that would reproduce what they saw Jesus do. And so we have to build leaders all the time. It's not about Vitaly or it's not about any one person. Everything's about Jesus. And so Jesus died, was resurrected, went up to heaven, and he paid the price for every believer to become just like him. So our job is to make and reproduce many Jesuses on this earth. Amen? And so it's not an option. And so uh, what we have to do is train and equip people to become as Jesus. So um, I don't see myself better than anybody else. The only thing that's different about me than a lot of people here is just I've been doing it longer. That's the only difference. But everything that I can do, every single person can do because I don't do it in my name. I do it in Jesus' name. I just choose to believe. And so I'm very transparent. And so as soon as one of the things that I told God, that as soon as he teaches me something, it doesn't matter what area, it could be healing, it could be work, it could be finances, it could be marriage, anything. If I know something, if God teaches me something, I will share it with everybody. I will keep no secrets. Why? Because I want God to trust me that he can share something with me, teach me something, and I will share it with everybody. Why? Because whatever he's teaching me, it's not for me, it's for the whole body, it's for everybody, because he provided the same for everybody. And God wants every single person to function in his design, in his image, and how he created us. And so we started doing is, um, so every Wednesday we have 
a DHT slash healing room. And so some of our leaders decided that they wanted to learn how to teach DHT. And so what we did is we had uh, training for people that wanted to learn how to do the DHT. And so we went through lesson by lesson and we made notes and we'll have, we'll open this up again, maybe this fall or at some point, I'll let everybody know who else wants to learn to do that. And so we started out with breaking out. So when you look at the DHT manual, it looks, it, it looks pretty complicated because it's just a bunch of thoughts and scriptures. And so what we did is we organized it to where anybody can go by points and start teaching it. And so what we did is um, we provided an opportunity for those who wanted to, and they would present one point. It would start out with 15 minutes. And so then they grew to doing two points to 30 minutes. And our goal is typically a DHT session is 45 minutes. And so people were practicing and practicing presenting the DHT. And that got them to a point to where every leader has two to three lessons that they like. And so when we go and do these DHTs, I don't want to be the one that's doing all 20 lessons. I want everybody else to do it because, again, if I'm doing the 20 lessons, then guess what? Then I'm the only one that can go do a DHT, and I'm slowing God down. I don't want to slow God down. My goal is that we're able to have so many ministers be able to do that to where we can send groups of three. Remember, if we have small towns, we can break up and we say, okay, three couples are going to go into this town do a conference. Three couples are going to go into this town. And so for me, it was really nice because we were able to go, a group of us were doing a DHT or conference in Libby, and our church was continuing to go. And so we already grew. Before, if we had to do something like that, we'd have to shut down the church. So if we had to leave to go do somewhere else, to do a conference somewhere else, we'd have to shut down the church. But now we reproduced to where people can stay here and people can go. And now we just need to grow even more to where my goal is that continuously, as the church is going here, people are getting trained. Uh, we have teams that are going out into different parts of the country and are continuing to do these conferences, and the kingdom of God is expanding and multiplying. Remember what Jesus did, right? He took his disciples, he broke them up into pairs, and he said, go to every town. So he trained them to go. So the training is not for us to sit here and wonder what we're going to do, but the training is that we're equipping ourselves so we can go out and expand the kingdom of God and believing that every single person can do. And so um, I'll start out. So who has the microphone? So I'll start out with um, Dan. And so Dan did a lesson. This was his first time doing a lesson at a DHC conference. And so maybe Dan, share a little bit how you got to that spot and how easy that was to do. Um, first of all, was I, uh, I thought it was kind of fun, but um, also the lesson that I was doing is a lesson that I struggled with before. So we had some choices like to pick out, you know, uh, the lessons that we wanted to teach. So thank you for the choices <laughs> that you gave us. Uh, so I chose a job, uh, or Job, sorry, uh, Job and uh, Paul Storn, because um, where I grew up, you know, in a, in a uh, conservative church, I struggled with those questions again, so I felt like I was comfortable with that, um, because I know a lot about it, and uh, uh, that's, that's kind of how that was. Is there anything else that you wanted? Maybe share how this lesson, what, because when you started learning, uh, you got to practice on your relatives. And so yeah. you were able to uh, share with people maybe how you practiced, but you constantly having to go back into the Word and get grounded in it. So when people right. would ask you questions, you knew how to answer. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, basically, my mind was already renewed to that truth that God doesn't teach us through sickness and that we shouldn't line ourselves up to Job or Paul's thorn. So um, I came across many, many times, you know, within, within my family, that was probably their number one uh, topic about Paul and Job to talk about. 
And it was just constantly, you know, just speaking to them and telling them that, hey, you should not relate yourself to Job or Paul. You're not of them, you know, cut that off. Stop going backwards. Uh, you are part of Christ. You are one with him. So you're cut off from any Job's or any, or any, any Paul's. Even if there was a sickness, which the Bible proves there wasn't, that Paul was suffering. You know, even if it w was, we are followers of Jesus. We're not followers of Paul. So um, that's, I was just kind of, that's how I got grounded sort of in that uh, message. And my mind was sort of very well renewed in that topic on the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm part of Christ, not anyone else. So. Okay. We'll go to Natalie. So she did two lessons, and she did an amazing job. Everybody did an amazing job. So as far as people are concerned, they would have never known that this was their first time doing a DHT lessons at an actual conference. We practice here, obviously, you know, like they practice on Wednesdays, but it's completely different when you go into a new crowd and you're doing a DHT like a real DHT. Like there is no, uh, everybody that's looking at you, they're all new. They're, most of them think that you're crazy when you teach the DHT. And so like the look that they're giving you is like, what world are you from? So it's completely different. And so I gotta say, so like our team did an amazing job of training it to where, because I was sitting in the back listening and I was rejoicing with Jesus together all the time because <laughs> they did such a good job. Like nobody would have known that th this is their first time. They taught it in a way to where it was as if they were doing it, you know, for 20 years. So maybe share how, how you got to the spot to where you're able to do that. Like maybe share how you were taking notes, combining things, just kind of share like how, your approach, how you got to a spot where you're able to be, have two, two lessons ready and okay. do it like that. Um, so I guess I'll start with, I would have never thought that I would be doing a teaching in front of people because <laughs> back when I was in college and I would be taking like a speech class, I would go up front and, um, and I had my notes and I'd go from the first line and skip everything in the last line and be done because I would be so nervous I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, <laughs> and so it was really funny to me that like the second lesson I was doing, they couldn't get me off of the lesson because I was like, I have to finish this, hold on. It's <laughs> already cutting into the lunchtime. So I think that is a testimony of itself that when I came to Healing Room, I always believed I was shy and then by now, I'm already doing a teaching, two of them, two teachings. Um, and so how I got to that point is, well, first, going through Healing Room really helped me to get free from being shy. And then, um, and then learning the DHT and taking notes and then practicing here, I went from like five minutes to like 20. And then we did, you know, huge lessons when we were doing the DHT in Montana. Um, so I think practicing in the healing, during healing rooms, that was really helpful. But what was the most helpful was learning the truth about myself that I'm not shy. That was what helped me the most, I think, with teaching two teachings <laughs> is being set free. Awesome. So. All right, so we'll go to Oksana. So Oksana, share how you were able to do it, how you got to a spot where you're able to get up there and do a lesson. So like Natasha before, I was also very shy and afraid to speak in front of like groups of people. Um, so I also started out with like five minute lessons um, and that was really hard for me <laughs> to begin with when we first started practicing on Wednesdays. And um, I think what really helped is just growing in confidence and like getting more rooted in what I believed because then that's, that's what grew my confidence is like, okay, I know this because I know that I know and now I'm confident enough to talk about it in front of people and share it. Um, so that really helped me get to that point and then just 
practicing just going from five minutes to 15 to 20 to 30. Um, so that's kind of, that's how I got to that point. Awesome. So when I was a kid, I was so scared of public speaking to where on a Sunday school, they made us uh, learn these um, little poems and they were literally like four tenths, you know, four to 10 sentences, very easy. And what would happen is I would come up in front of a crowd and I would just freeze and I would freeze and like, and just, I would not know what to say. And so my mom or the teacher would be like trying to walk me through it. And I was so scared. I couldn't even repeat after them. That's how scared I was to be in front of people. And so the devil really used that ingrained in me because the worst thing that would happen is when I was a kid, it didn't matter as much. But when I was becoming a teenager and then when I would go up there and freeze and then the whole crowd would start laughing. And I felt so ashamed and so humiliated to where I actually had to get delivered from that. And so I remember when um, the last church that I was part of, the pastor says like, hey, can you come out there and make announcements? I would have rather walk or jog to New York and back than to get up and do that. I would, I would be willing to do anything. But I knew that after I got saved and after uh, God healed me, that I could not stay silent. So I had to, this message started teaching me to overcome that fear and to move from it. And so um, I started little by little, just like everybody else. And now I have no issues being in front of people. And so it became very easy. And so I can't even explain how I transitioned from freezing to unfreezing. And so it's almost like I'm believing to believing. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of, but um, everybody can do it. And so for me, when somebody says like, oh, we're afraid of public speaking, I don't think there's anybody that was worse than me. And so if I'm able to speak in front of people right now, that means everybody can do it. And so... I love seeing people from not or being afraid to talk to little by little by little to give people opportunities to, to practice to be able to do that. And so, um, yeah, so that was really good. So we're going to transition to the actual ministry there. So, um, again, so we'll start since, Oksana, you have uh, the microphone. So maybe share some of the things that you saw uh, God doing through you and what you were able to uh, see and how you were able to help people when you were there. Okay. Um, well, we did see a lot. A lot of people get delivered and just their expressions would change from when you first start praying for them to, to the end. They're, they're glorifying God. Um, and then one specific uh, situation was on the last day on Sunday, um, Natasha and I were praying for a woman and she came up and she started telling us how she's at this age where her sister had passed away from a certain cancer and she has this fear that that's going to happen to her. And so first we started praying for her for, for that and for, we explained the truth to her. Um, and so the, I don't think she had any pain to begin with for that, right? right? It was just like in her mind. And we just spoke clarity in her mind because she said she just felt really confused. And then we asked her if she does have any pain in her body right now. And she said her knees, they really hurt and they constantly hurt. So then we started praying for her knees and she, she still felt confused. And we prayed um, just peace and clarity in her mind. And she ended up falling over um, which for me was a new experience too, and I to pray for someone and they fall over. Um, that hasn't that was a first for me as a minister, and so then after she got up, she was a little confused still, like what happened to her because like she fell over, and um, then once everybody got her to stand up, and we asked her about her knees, she had no more pain in her knees, and she even started jumping and you could just see the shock in her face like she was just like really shocked with everything that just like happened to her this, from falling over to the fact that her knee pain left her so that was really cool 
Yeah, I thought that was really cool because so they were ministering to this lady to the right of me, and I didn't see anybody that was spotting them. So um, next I know, I turn around next, and this lady was tall. I mean, she was she might have been taller than I am. Uh, she was pretty tall. And the next thing I know, like this lady's on the floor. So here you have two short girls praying for her, <laughs> and now she's lying on the floor. So for, it took me a second to figure out what happened. <laughs> and so it was really cool. But, I mean, just to pick her up, I think, Alex, you were helping. You're, I mean, uh, he, he caught her when she oh, he, felt okay. he did catch her. So she, she was scared to get up. Um, after we Hold the microphone closer. after we helped her up, she started like dancing and jumping and like started doing all sorts of cool stuff with her knees. So I I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, but it took uh, both Alex and I a lot of effort to get her up. I mean, she was a she was a bigger lady. Um, and so Alex, um, this was your first time, so you were learning by fire. And so Alex set up the process by marrying to a leader, <laughs> so he, he's having to learn everything quick on the run. Maybe share your experience, like from your perspective, what did you learn or what did you see? I think in the beginning, um, I agreed to go on this trip because Exano was going, so I agreed and then instantly started getting attacked. Uh, work intensified neighbors started parking weird and just i mean like the devil started working through everybody to discourage and then um towards like the end i was like, i was regretting that i agreed to go but once we started driving there i was i just set my mind you know what it's going to be good the devil's trying to discourage me because he knows it's going to be good uh once we got there i had a dream that there was a like a like instantly it was it was the first night I had a dream, and uh, there was a like a, ta a taekwondo master, and uh, I was in his class and he had this huge samurai sword, but it wasn't his. He was just a teacher, and I asked him because I thought the sword was cool. It was a it was a Japanese katana, and I'm like, hey man, like what's with that sword? You know, like. Whose is that? And he, I don't remember who it was, but he pointed to him and he's like, go ask him, he'll give it to you. And so I thought, like, I know this guy, like, I don't even have to ask him. So I take the sword and immediately I go into battle, like immediately. So, um, yeah, and right, right, after, right after that, I just noticed... I just noticed that you don't, when you step out, you don't even have to try. The Holy Spirit starts showing you just in, instantly visions, dreams. I mean, words of knowledge right away. You don't even have to try. If you step out for God, he just starts, you know, using you right away. Even though I didn't do much, but, you know. <laughs> okay, so Natalie, you want to share you, yeah, your experience from what you observed, what God was doing to people through you. Okay. Um, like a testimony? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So <laughs> on the first day, there was a lady, um, and she was there the whole time for the whole conference. Um, and so throughout the day, different leaders were praying for her. So I think she was um, getting better, like slowly throughout the day. And so then we had a healing service in the evening on that first day, and I was praying for her, and I asked her, like, do you feel anything in your body? And she was telling me, I have this scratchiness in my throat. And so I thought, you know, um, if I pray, this thing's going to go. And I prayed for her, and nothing happened. She still felt the scratchiness. And I'm like, well, we're going to pray for it again. And so we prayed for a few times. Well, I prayed for it a few times. And um, nothing, 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 nothing. And I'm like, well, it's going to go, so we're going to pray again. Um, and so I prayed again, and then I just, like, had this burst, and I prayed in tongues, <laughs> like, really intensely. And out of nowhere, she just starts yelling, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It was so awesome. You saw it. <laughs> it was so cool to watch her because she just starts praising God. And she just stood there yelling hallelujah for a while. 
um, I think for just the rest of the time because she was so happy that it was gone. And um, so that was really exciting, but I think the best part was that then after she got healed from that, whatever it was that was bothering her, um, was gone, and then she was there for the whole conference, and I mean, like, taking notes the whole time, and she was, like, hanging out with us, and um, and then on, I think, the last evening, or, yeah, the last evening of the conference that we were doing, the DHT training, um, we did, like, a practical teaching, right, practical um, application, so we were just kind of guiding people to start practicing and praying for each other. Um, and so she was praying for another person, and I guess she prayed for them, and their headache went away. So it was cool that she got healed, and then she was just, like, immediately applying what she learned. And we watched the whole thing, and it was awesome, because then I was talking to her right before we left, and she was saying, yeah, I'm going to go back home, and I already know I'm going to be praying for all my friends. <laughs> and so that was really cool. I think that's the way it should be, right? Amen. A little background um, to this lady that she's talking about. She got saved only two years ago. And just because she decided to get a job at a company um, that had Christian owners, and so they were planting seeds, planting seeds, and finally she gets saved. So she's a toddler in Christ. She came just really, really wanting to know the truth. She wanted to get equipped. And she was so diligent. Um, she actually, I coached them when they were doing the first prayer for healing. And the lady's back pain and the headache went. And this was her very, very first prayer for healing. She was super excited. She just saw it work right there. Um, she's also, she was so, like, her, the soil was so ready for her. Like, she, she was so open to receive the message that just as we're talking and we're just talking about the scripture and the message, she was getting delivered as just we're here, just hearing us talk. You can see she was getting delivered because she would, she would have a realization, almost like a revelation, and she would like breathe in and out, and you could tell she's accepted it as truth, right? And as the truth sets you free. And so you can literally see on her, because she was so open to, to God's word, you can literally see God's word just setting her free of, of all the lies that she used to believe. Um, this is also the lady um, that overheard me talking about a strawberry rhubarb pie at one of the stores and how we didn't have an oven for it. And she secretly bought the pie and used the church's oven where we were at to warm it up and bought the ice cream and um, treated us to a surprise after our uh, ministry on the last day. And you could just feel the acceptance and the love from people, and um, that was a cherry on top. Yeah, wanted. So one of the things that, um, that I like about when we go into smaller conferences, smaller groups, is it's we get to know people and we get to build relationships and so we build people's trust a lot of times that's not possible when you're in a big large group setting and so they were able to ask questions they were able to um, talk about their personal situations and so uh, there were people that came to this conference from little towns nearby where we believe they're going to go back and they're going to start something there and doors will open up for us to go there and so that was just uh, an amazing experience, like just the, that family atmosphere. Um, so, Dan, do you want to share um, some of your experience? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think it is it is actually pretty cool, and uh, uh, you get to learn a lot as you minister to people in a smaller setting, like we did. Uh, there was not many people coming at you like, you know, you pray for them and let them go, but you can actually pour into them. And uh, like Natalie said, like, uh, I mean, um, a lot of the deliverances that we kind of had to go through, we pray for deliverance for people. And then as the Holy Spirit tells us things, you know, and brings the scripture into remembrance, we just pour it out on them. And you could see, as Natalie said, like they're just getting set free and like they're 
all of a sudden raising up their heads and they're smiling as they're they're hearing the truth of who they really are in Christ and what Jesus Christ has for them, you know, because a lot of the uh, people I noticed, like they were mentally in anguish there. And it's because obviously of the lies of the devil uh, within the church. So it was awesome to see that and also uh, to learn from these experiences, to concentrate on where the Holy Spirit is speaking and just tell them things. Um, and it's it was very just liberating for people uh, in that sense. Um, as far as also deliverance, you know, it's, it's pretty cool seeing like how people, like sometimes we had this one lady that was just overreacted and um, because she was in so, so much torment uh, through what she experienced in the past. And um, yeah, we just let her kind of calm down and because uh, the devil was was just, you know, um, getting her in a lot of anger and worked up. And then as, as we let her calm down, you know, and we just um, pour into her with scripture and she started getting set free and set free. And then uh, it almost makes you want to cry when she cries, you know. Uh, so it's just the joy of, uh, you know, seeing uh, people get set free. Um, also with healing, like uh, my wife isn't here right now, but uh, she was praying for this one lady and uh, we were praying for her. She had back pain uh, for many years. I don't recall how many years. And uh, God healed her right away. And she was just uh, just very thrilled and like super happy. So that was, that was cool. Um, but overall, like I enjoy these experiences because you get to learn a lot as you minister and um, how the Holy Spirit talks to you and guides you as well. So it was awesome. Do you want to share about the lady that we ministered to that lost her daughter? How she was delivered? So um, a lady came in and I could tell that the locals um, are being very supportive of her. So everybody's kind of giving her hugs. And you just, I just got the sense that there was trauma, some, something with trauma. And um, what we did not know is we ministered to her um, and we prayed for her deliverance and she cried a lot. She got set free quite a bit, um, but she kind of rushed off afterwards and we didn't know what her story was. And um, I saw in the spirit that the, the, her biggest weight was guilt. Like she was carrying um, an unreasonably huge amount of guilt. And we didn't know why, and we didn't have time to address it the first evening. And um, then uh, one of the local leaders there just shared with us that two years ago, um, she went to a conference with her daughter and right after the conference, they got into an accident, and the daughter was killed in that accident. So she survived, but she was living with this guilt, um, and it was, it was making her body fall apart. She had um, this tightness and pain in her neck full time where it was hard for her to breathe and hard for her to swallow. This guilt was literally like choking her. And um, so we were praying for the symptoms the first night, and so the symptoms lessened and um, everything in her neck released, so she was really happy about that. But we knew there was an underlining cause of, of all of that. So the second night, um, we, she came back and we were really happy to see her. We started praying for her and Vitaly led her through a forgiveness prayer. Basically, we kicked out guilt and condemnation, and we explained to her that that's not you. Um, and then she prayed a prayer of forgiveness towards herself and towards God, because she was also bitter at God. And that just, I mean, just the floodgates opened up. She just cried it all out, and, and she was done. She was set free. You can tell by her expression she was free. It's the way she was walking, the way she was talking, the way she was looking at us. Um, you could tell she was no longer under that burden of all that guilt. Um, 
and she agreed with us. Her daughter's in heaven, and she's waiting for her there, and um, she wants her to continue living here because she was getting to a point of not wanting to live anymore, um, and she agreed that God needs her here. She's going to be living here. She's going to be doing her part, and when she's, you know, when she's ready, she'll see her daughter in heaven, um, I don't believe this lady would have lasted much longer if she didn't get set free. Um, they were really concerned about her, but they didn't know how to help her. And that's another reason why, like, the, the GHD conferences, it's not just we'll come and pray for you and set you free. It's we'll come and teach you and equip you and help you how to do this by yourself. And we'll help, you know, we'll pray for your healing and your deliverance and we'll set you free so that you can step that out and walk that out in freedom now and help the rest of the people around you. And I think this is why this is so important is because equipping the saints, equipping the rest of the body of Christ is very important, especially during this time. So one of the things about this lady, and this is why I like um, using healing as it's almost like a hook. It brings people in. So the reason she came in is because something started happening in her throat to where it was uh, getting to a point where she had a hard time breathing. So something was growing or something was happening here that she was struggling with. So as we started ministering to that, the pain started loosening up. But the next, so we ministered to her the first night. And then the second night after she got delivered, then... And she cried out that guilt and everything, and everything let go. And so what we're learning, and this is something that's important to understand, is like as she was allowing this bitterness, guilt, and condemnation to grow into her, the devil already started killing her. So all of these things were happening because of something that was already happening on a spiritual level. Remember, the devil legally cannot touch anybody. He starts with something, and before he can do something to you, he starts doing it little by little and by guilt, by condemnation, and that's how he starts coming in. And so imagine this lady. Um, she's not very old. I mean, she's fairly young. She comes with her daughter to a conference, and so you would think, like, okay, they're doing something good for God. They want to learn how to minister. So they came to a conference, and then they drive out, and her daughter gets killed. So... Imagine how unjust that seems like and how bad it looks like. And so as I was, um, after we ministered to her the first night, we were driving back home and it was already dark and we're going through like very curvy roads. And so as I was driving, the devil started telling me the same thing. And so for me, when the devil speaks, like it's irrelevant, um, I cut it off. But Holy Spirit pointed out something, you know, that I did not notice before is that, so as I was driving, the devil started giving me thoughts that um, as you're going to come around this curve, you know, like a large deer is going to come out, you're going to hit the deer and we're going right next to a river and you're going to fly off the cliff into the river. And at first, you know, like when I heard that thought, I'm like, no devil, you're stupid, get lost. And so as I was kept going, he would send me another one, another thought, and another thought, and he was doing that on my path. Well, so I'm already trained myself. I trained myself and I prepared because I always look at what we teach, you know, when Jesus, when the devil was tempting him, Jesus would reply, it's written, it's written, it's written. But Holy Spirit reminded me, like, in the past, when I did not understand that, and when that thought would come in and I would dwell on it and agree with it, and I would get into accidents and bad things would happen to me. So the Spirit was showing me that we, are, we control everything. The devil cannot do anything to us without our permission. If we learn this truth and we proactively say no to the devil and respond that it's written, we are untouchable. And so that's our, our job is not to wait for bad things to happen and then try to get help, God's help to get out of it. And he will help but we have to learn how to stop everything proactively. And so as I you know, realized what that was doing, I said, no, get lost, and then everything left, and he never bothered me the rest of the way, and obviously nothing happened, nothing's gonna happen, because you know, I believe you know, what's, you know, the way things are supposed to be. But Holy Spirit kept reminding me how important it is to be proactively being in the Word, 
seeing yourself how God sees you, walking out this truth and not allowing the devil to send you these lies. And so what happened to that lady and that daughter was not supposed to happen. But what I've learned is that typically when I attend a conference or something, the devil comes with fear. Why? Because he wants to steal the truth. And so when he sees somebody as a threat, he wants to kill you. He wants to wipe you out. But we have the ability given to us by Jesus by telling them, no, it's written and nothing will happen to you. We have to see ourselves untouchable and we have to watch our thoughts. We have to pay attention to what the enemy is doing and cut him off and not allow him not to dwell on the lies that he's selling. And so I believe that these bad things that are happening to good people, it's because the devil sends them a lie. He tries to wipe him out because Jesus said very clearly that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you dead. Don't be surprised. It doesn't matter who you are as a person, the faster he can kill you, the better he, you know, that is his goal. That is his mission in life. And Jesus said he came to give life and life abundant. So in Christ, we have life and life abundant. And so if we believe and speak what Jesus said, what God says about us, then nothing will happen to us, right? Nothing will touch us. We, be, we are completely harmless, untouched. The devil cannot get to us. And we have to learn that. So uh, does anybody else want to share anything else before we close out? Um, Got something else? So a lady came into the conference, and you can tell by her that she was sick with something serious. She came to get healing. Um, we figured she was probably, well, like grandma age, like she would have grandkids already that age. Um, when we got to talking to her, she had um, cancer of the lymph nodes. And this, she's already done chemo three times, and it came back after the third time. The third time, the type of chemo that they used, it's actually called the Red Devil. And she's a Christian, so that really bothered her. Um, so this lady has been tormented by this thing. Um, she has, you know, she's lost all her hair. Her hair is now growing back. So after the three times of chemo and the cancer coming back, she told the doctors, okay, I'm done with this treatment. Like, I, you know, it hasn't worked three different times, so I'm not doing it again. And because she had chemo so, so much, she actually has like a permanent tube in her chest area that's implanted into her. Um, which was also causing her trouble and pain and discomfort. So we prayed for her healing. Um, oh, well, she told the doctors that she's done with treatment, and um, the doctor said, well, we can no longer be your doctors then. And she said, well, that's fine. Get rid of this tube. I don't need it anymore. They refused to do it, so now she's stuck with it. She's having to find a doctor who knows where who's going to agree to remove this tube inside of her. Um, and so we prayed for her healing and told her, okay, walk around, go check. She comes back, and I guess she can feel the lymph nodes. And she comes back, and she's smiling, and she said, it's so much better. It doesn't hurt anymore. Um, it's much smaller. Both of them are much smaller. So it's working. It's working. And I said, okay, great. Let's pray for you again. And so she, we told her, just stay here on the first row. We're going to keep coming back, and we're going to keep blasting this thing. We're going to keep praying for you. So we were doing that. And then when I got a chance to, um, when he was ministering to some of the guys, I got a chance to walk away. And so I came back, and I just started talking to her. And the Holy Spirit led me to share um, the testimony of my grandma, how she went through chemo once, and then when the cancer came back, she's like, nope, not doing that again. That was miserable. That wasn't life. That was awful existence. I'm not going to do that. God's going to heal me because that's what the Bible says. And so I shared that testimony with her, and that kind of lifted her up. Okay, this works. Like, it really, and I told her, I said, the pastor that prayed for her didn't even believe in healing. She's the one who pulled it out. And so I just shared her testimony after testimony, and then I started talking to her, and I noticed that her faith was in her faith. 
not in the scripture, not in God's, like she wasn't trusting God fully. And so I tried to, I was explaining to her, so how do you know that you have faith? Um, and so I explained to her, so this is the word of God. Do you believe that this is what God said? She said, yes. Do you believe that that is the highest thing that you can believe? Does anything else compare to it? Does, is anything else, can anything else override the word of God? She said, no. I said, okay, so if this is what God said, then it must be true, correct? And she said, yes. And so I kind of just simplified it for her. How do you know that you have faith? Well, if you believe and trust that this is God's word and that's what you're going to stand on and you're not going to back down, you have faith. And I think um, something set her free because I think she, was, she had this battle in her mind. Um, well, maybe I'm not getting healed because I don't have enough faith. So that was her problem. Um, so we noticed that a lot of the, we had four cases of cancer, I think. Um, and this was a small group of people. And we noticed that the origin was all on a thought level, which is really important. Renew your mind, watch your thoughts, watch what you say, um, because it all started here, right? If you can stop it here, it can't affect you any other way. Um, after I talked to her, and this really, really surprised me, um, she told me she has five kids. And I said, wow, um, how old are they? Well, they range from 19 years old to four years old. She's nowhere near being a grandma's age. She said, I know I look very old, but I'm not that old. She says, I have a four-year-old child still. Um, she said, chemo did this to me. And um, she's all gray because chemo did that. So this is not life and life abundant, right? This is stealing, killing, and destroying. It's been stealing the mom from the kids. It's been stealing finances, health, and everything. So um, when I shared that with the group, that really made us mad. <laughs> So um, we prayed for her. I told her what to do with the proclamation book, explained to her what faith is, and we're all standing and believing that she is healed in the name of Jesus, and um, she's going to recover, and she's going to come find us, and she's going to testify with all of her five kids. Amen? Yeah. So that's... Yeah, praise God. So, and this is why we do this, because when you see what the devil is doing to people, it is so unjust, it is so evil. Um, lives are getting destroyed, families are getting torn up. And we believe that every person that we can minister to and get them restored, get them set free, we're setting free a generation of people. So God showed me this a while ago, that for every person that we can pull out out of the devil's jaws and put him into the kingdom of God, from that person forward, we're starting a godly generation. And so it's worth fighting for every person. And we see Jesus said that, you know, he left the 99 to go look for the one. And so that is our job, is to pull out as many people as we possibly can out of the jaws of the devil, because he's evil, he doesn't care, he just wants to destroy and tear people up. And so as a body of Christ, um, this local body here, we don't sit around wondering what the devil is going to do. We are on the attack. We're aggressively going and we're destroying his works. And so we believe that we're going to grow stronger. There's going to be more of us doing this. And so we're really excited. And so the doors are opening up. And so I'll close out with the final testament. It's not fair that you teased them with the wedding that we ended up being well, at and you didn't share. explain. Are you going to share that? Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, we got invited on this um, property with uh, this uh, large group of people there. Um, and we ministered to them, did a service for them, ministered to them. And then afterwards, you know, we ate with them. And so then we're sitting there with the life team there. And so we're talking to the life team. And then uh, this car pulls up. And the life team leader says, yeah, I was going to talk to them about stuff. And so uh, this couple comes, and um, 
they were married a long, long time ago, and then uh, they got into a fight, and so they divorced each other. And somehow they got together, and so the life team leader told them, like, hey, come, and we'll talk to you, and we'll talk about getting married. And so um, basically they came as unbelievers, so we ministered. He's a guy who's missing some details. <laughs> um, they, were, they went through a really, really nasty divorce because they're both unbelievers. They did not know how to be Jesus to each other. Because of the divorce, it cost them $30,000. Uh, they lost their home. Their family is a mess. All of their kids are in the world. They're really, really concerned about all of the kids. Um, there's a lot of drama in the family. So they lost everything, right? You, you play dumb games, you win dumb prizes, right? And so they were in the kingdom of the devil. There's obvious signs of drug addiction, previous drug addictions. Um, and so finally they woke up, realized that they are really meant to be together, that they can't live without each other. So they got back together after officially being divorced for a long time. And then Joseph was planting seeds because they kept complaining that everything's wrong, we lost everything, and he was planting seeds that you living the way you're living right now is not in the will of God, so you can't expect blessings to pour over you because you're, you're, you're not believers. You, you've got to think it through. You need to figure out what you want out of life and go after it. And so we walked him. So they thought that they came and Joseph was going to talk to them about marriage. And so what ended up happening is we walked them through salvation, got them delivered, got them healed, got them baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then the life team uh, leader there got them married. And they're going to be now working with him and he's going to be discipling them. So it was, um, it was just amazing how we got to see like Step by step, you know, like what Jesus said, if you believe this is what's going to happen. And so we just saw that play out within a few hours. And so it's just, it's amazing how we were just available. We just went, you know, and did what Jesus commanded us to do. And Jesus fulfilled the scriptures because we believe Jesus fulfilled the scriptures and we got to witness them. And so uh, if you want to see the scriptures fulfilled, be a believer and be available and scriptures will be fulfilled in your life, and you'll see them working all the time. And so, and it was really sweet because um, before Joseph married them again, he had them do their own vows, and they were crying. They could barely speak. They were crying doing their vows, and there wasn't uh, a dry tear around us. Um, and you could tell they really meant it. And every time he would ask the lady, um, "So, what would you like?" What? And she said. Everything opposite of what I used to do. Like, if that's the opposite, that's what I'm going to do. If, if that's God, then that's what I'm going to do. I don't, she doesn't even own a Bible. And so she's like, I'm ready. Whatever you tell me to do, however you tell me to do. And it didn't stop there because we got a testimony. The next day, Leah got a message from, from uh, Sonia, who's Joseph's wife, so Sonia scheduled a meeting with the same lady because she's going to disciple her into Christ. And so she scheduled the meeting. And this lady, now knowing that she's baptized in the Spirit and she could pray in tongues, decided, well, then I can hear from the Spirit. So she tells Sonia, you know, I think the Holy Spirit told me to invite my daughter. Can I do that? And Sonia said, of course. And so she brings her 19-year-old daughter with her and she grabs a friend with her while Sonia gets both of them saved literally the next day after the mom and the dad got saved and we told them you get restored you will see the rest of your kids restored and so you've got two days we've got four souls you know saved and now Joseph and Sonia are gonna disciple them raise them up into Christ yeah so yeah thank you Jesus yeah so that's that's how amazing God is, and uh, the good news is just like I read from the beginning, every believer can do this, and we do this in the name of Jesus. So we want to thank Jesus for everything. Uh, we give him all the glory. 
Uh, because as humans from us, we can't change anybody. We can't talk anybody into anything. Only Jesus can do it. And so all we have to do is just use the name of Jesus and be obedient and be believers. And so we want to thank everybody for your prayers um, that um, we were blessed and we were able to accomplish all that. And so we're excited to come back and share the testimonies with you and so everybody knows what you're part of. And also, hopefully, this will encourage you to do the same, right? And so uh, we have, as a church, we provide opportunities. Anybody that wants to learn how to minister to people, you're in the right place, we'll train you for that. Um, the limit of how far you go is between your years. You decide how far you want to go because God's will is for you to go as far as Jesus would go. Amen? And so this is, a, all of us are going into the fullness of Christ. So we're going to wrap it up.